Picture a vast area of southern Florida, which to all outward appearances is just the way it was when the only residents were Native Americans. Not the Seminoles or Miccosukees, but the Calusa Indians who may have been in this region thousands of years ago. In the more than 100 miles west from Key Largo to Cape Sable and then northwest to Everglades City, there are no condos, no fast food places, no crowded beaches. The names that leap off the map announce that this is wilderness. Hell's Bay, Lossman's River, Mosquito Island, Crocodile Dragover. This is where mainland Florida ends and Florida Bay and the Gulf of Mexico begin. It is the coastal region of Everglades National Park. So join us as we explore the Everglades backcountry and the wilderness waterway, from Flamingo to Everglades City and the 10,000 Islands, with a few side trips along the way. Unlike the east and west coasts of Florida, the coastal region of Everglades National Park is not made up of long sandy beaches. Well, there are a few islands with sandy shores. For the most part, the visitor will see mile after mile of mangroves with occasional patches of coastal prairie. The entire region is interspersed with inshore lakes and bays, rivers and creeks. It is a wondrous place to be explored by canoe, shallow draft boat or houseboat. The two main access points are Flamingo at the southern tip of the park and Everglades City at the western park boundary. Our visit starts on the east at the main entrance to Everglades National Park, just a few miles southwest of Homestead, Florida. Driving into the park along the main highway, visitors can't help but notice the results of Hurricane Andrew, trees blown down or stripped of their branches. From the main park entrance to Flamingo is a 38 mile drive and there is plenty to see and do along the way. Whether you're headed for a water adventure or sticking to dry land, there are places to picnic overlooking lakes and ponds. Some of the local residents, such as this alligator, are moochers, always looking for a hand up. Remember, feeding any of the wildlife is against park regulations. In the case of the gator, it could be dangerous. And it might make this turkey vulture and other animals too dependent on human handouts. There are several walking trails right off the highway to Flamingo. Most are short and wheelchair accessible. However, at Long Pine Key, the interconnecting trails run for seven miles, and there are several longer trails in the Flamingo area. Incidentally, walk carefully and be observant when on the park trails, since you might encounter a poisonous snake, such as this diamondback rattler. There are four species of poisonous snakes in the park. Those interested in the park's birds will find stops at Morazic and Coot Bay Ponds worthwhile, especially in winter. Egrets, herons, ibises, and other wading birds gather in the water and mangroves to preen and feed. If you're lucky, you might catch a glimpse of a colorful roseate spoonbill. Visitor Center, which is a departure point for boating and fishing in Florida Bay and the backcountry. In fact, many boaters run across the bay from Key Largo, Isla Morada, and other points in the Florida Keys. While Flamingo is a somewhat isolated outpost, the facilities are first rate. The lodge offers 103 air conditioned guest rooms and a swimming pool overlooking Florida Bay. In addition, there are 24 spacious cottages with kitchen facilities. The Lodge restaurant features an extensive menu of steak, seafood, and local specialties, and dining with spectacular views of the islands in the bay. Just below the restaurant is a gift shop where visitors may buy t-shirts, reading material dealing with the Everglades region and its fish and wildlife, videos, arts and crafts, and a whole lot more. Directly adjacent to the restaurant and gift shop is the ranger station, which includes displays focusing on the flora and fauna of this part of the park. Rangers are available to give talks and demonstrations and to lead hikes and canoe tours. There will be mosquitoes possibly right at the shore, left the side of the road before we go in. Mm -hmm. So I'm not putting any, I'm being brave and not putting any mosquito repellent on. Because once we get out of the water, we're okay. Oh yes, mosquitoes are around all year, but are at their peskiest during the summer rainy season. Bring plenty of repellent if you'll be in the park for a while. 
If you're boating, you'll find the farther from shore you are, the fewer mosquitoes you'll encounter. Anchor up against the mangroves and you'll be swarmed. Next door to the lodge is the heart of the Flamingo Visitor Center, the marina. This modern facility includes paved launch ramps, dock space for visiting boaters and anglers, fueling facilities for boats and autos, a well-stocked store with groceries for those needing to stock up for an extended boat trip. Operating from the marina are sightseeing boats that explore Florida Bay and the backcountry. Fishing guides operate from the marina, and skiffs, canoes, and houseboats may be rented here. The Flamingo area is a great place for canoers. There are five backcountry canoe trails ranging from 3 to 12 miles in length, none too difficult for novice canoers. There are camping facilities along the longer trails. Just remember a backcountry camping permit is required for overnight trips. Permits are available at the ranger station adjacent to the lodge. Since our video crew was headed deep into the backcountry, we opted to take a houseboat, not only for the comfort and convenience, but because our sensitive video equipment would be well protected in case of rain. You don't have to be an expert mariner to rent one of these roomy houseboats. Julie of the rental staff gave us an extensive briefing on the operation of the boat and all of the equipment, from the refrigerator to the batteries to the safety and emergency gear. Back in, just lock it, bring it down. Lock it back into place. On your way back in, I ask when you get inside of the bridge to radio call me. Let me know you're coming, and then I'll be standing on this dock. I'll tie you up right here on the crash dock. Okay. If you desire, the staff will even give you a piloting lesson. Whether you plan to do some fishing, photograph wildlife, or just spend a couple of nights away from it all, a houseboat is a great way to go. With four double-sized bunks, it will sleep as many as eight people. And each houseboat has refrigeration, gas stove, toilet, shower with hot water, even bedding. Towels and cooking utensils are supplied. Just come aboard with groceries and personal effects, and you're ready to go. Once our food and gear were stored, Julie gave us some final tips on routes we could follow and the use of the VHF radio. The best radio contact is from here to marker 40 mm -hmm. with the, the bay. Um, our biggest problem is, is the mangroves. These are 80% yeah. iron, and the radio frequencies have a hard time passing through. Okay? If you should be up here and have any problems at all, um, if you can motor, you can more motor back in a little bit closer, or else um, keep calling. We have our tour boats and our charter yeah. captains out mm -hmm. there that can relay a message for you. Then we cranked up and headed north in the Buttonwood Canal. We were barely underway when we spotted what appeared to be an alligator sunning on the canal bank. A closer look revealed, to our great surprise, that it was a crocodile. This endangered reptile is rarely seen by park visitors. Crocs live in and around Florida Bay, mostly in the sanctuary areas close to the public. It took just a few minutes to enter the first open water area, Coot Bay, the beginning of the wilderness waterway. A few more minutes and we were across the small bay, cruising through Tarpon Creek, and then Whitewater Bay came into view. This is the largest open water passage along the waterway, and if you happen to be on the bay during a storm or when strong winds are blowing, you'll understand where it got its name. The Wilderness Waterway is a 99-mile route which, once past Whitewater Bay, winds through several rivers and smaller bays before ending at Everglades City. We opted to take the Joe River route, figuring it would afford better opportunities for viewing wildlife. While the direct route is well marked, as Julie pointed out, there are no markers in the river. We had to rely on our chart reading skills. Anyone entering this area should bring up-to-date nautical charts. The river is deep enough and wide enough to easily accommodate houseboats, and when winter winds are blowing, it's a much smoother trip. As we eased through the river, we started seeing bottlenose dolphins, porpoises. We found them rolling just about everywhere we went, in rivers and in open bays. If there is one dominant feature of this backcountry region of the park, it is the mangroves. The red mangrove, with the distinctive roots that arch from the trunk and take hold beneath the water, 
is found nearest the shoreline. The black, white, and buttonwood mangroves require progressively higher ground. The white and buttonwoods often form hammocks with mahogany and gumbo limbo trees. In this area where fresh water pours out of the Everglades and mixes with salt water, the mangroves are a critical part of a fragile ecosystem. The roots provide a haven for small fish and shrimp and trap food for them. The mangrove leaves add to the food chain by trapping sediment and organic debris washed in by the tides. The small fish and shrimp in turn attract the birds and gators and turtles and a wide variety of larger fish. It is one of the richest fisheries in North America. That's why in this remote region we frequently encounter anglers on the trail of snook, tarpon, redfish, and sea trout. That's part of the reason we're here. So is this, a swallowtail kite preening at the top of a tree. These hawk-like birds of prey spend most of the daylight hours in flight. They even eat their prey while flying. It's unusual to find one taking a break. It's taken us a couple of hours to negotiate the Joe River, and as we near its end, we come to the Joe River Chicky. This is typical of many of the campsites along or near the wilderness waterway. They are raised platforms, roof but no walls, and a chemical toilet. Remember, you need a permit, and mosquitoes could be a problem. From the Joe River, we enter Oyster Bay, and as we move slowly along the shoreline, we try to coax a fish out of the mangroves. We have no luck, but we find a solitary pelican who got away from the flock and is having a feast. At the northern end of the bay, we spot an osprey on final approach to its nest. It lands, joining its mate. There may be young in the nest. The osprey is a large eagle-like bird, often called a fish hawk, because its entire diet is of fish. We now move into the Little Shark River, which puts us back on the track of the wilderness waterway. We pass a group of white ibises, watching for fish from an overhanging branch. Their nesting area is nearby, partly concealed in the mangroves. It's now late in the day, time to find a place to anchor for the night. A nice looking cove comes into view, then we spot the Shark River Chicky, occupied by a couple on an overnight fishing trip. We decide not to bother them and move on. In less than a half mile, the Little Shark joins the Shark River, and we find a nearby calm anchorage as the sun drops behind the mangroves. Next morning, the mist is still rising off the river when we work up a breakfast appetite trying to catch a big one. Again, no luck. We don't know the best spots yet, but that's about to change. We had previously arranged to meet guide Art Subcheck, so we headed back down the Little Shark, and a few minutes later, Ponce de Leon Bay and the Gulf of Mexico came into view. Captain Art was right on time. He told us it only took him 40 minutes to make the run from Flamingo. It had taken us nearly four hours in the houseboat. He took us to one of his favorite spots, but the tide was wrong. Not even the pelicans and gulls were catching fish. No problem. We run across the bay to an area where several small creeks run out of the mangroves. This is real shallow water fishing, the reason we towed a skiff from Flamingo as many houseboaters do. Art anchored off a point and almost immediately we started catching redfish and trout. We were also hoping to tangle with a big snook. dinner here. Nice one. Nice one, huh? All right. Got to taste the rip this out. We don't. Nothing? We got a cruncher back in there. Huh? Little redfish for dinner? I caught it, Mom. <laughs> Fishing in the saltwater areas of the park requires a saltwater license. The redfish season is closed in March, April, and May, so in those months you must practice catch and release. During open season, the limit is one redfish per angler per day, and the fish must be longer than 18 inches, but not longer than 27 inches. The trout limit is 10 per day over 14 inches, 
and only one may be over 24 inches. The close season in Snook is January, February, and June, July, and August. The limit during open season is two per day, and only one may exceed 34 inches. The regulations can get pretty complicated, so it's a good idea to pick up a copy of the park and the state regulations from a ranger station as they apply to all of the species found in park waters. Yes, sir. Looking good. Beautiful. Snook like uh, creek miles, deep areas where there's a lot of flow, water flow. Uh, redfish, uh, they'll like shallow flats, uh, creek mouse also, but uh, they like the mangrove shorelines mostly. Um, sea trout uh, is one of the main fish down here, and you can find a lot of those out in open water. Um, three, three to four foot shallow bays back in the uh, back country, Whitewater Bay area. We should point out that a saltwater fishing license is required. Yeah and there are size and bag limits on many varieties of fish. The populations of snook and redfish were nearly decimated a few years ago, but both are making comebacks, thanks to limits combined with closed seasons at various times of the year. Be sure to get a copy of Everglades National Park fishing regulations before taking to the water. We found that the best all-round lures were various colored feather jigs tipped with shrimp. In addition to trout and reds, we also caught ladyfish, mackerel, jack crevel, and sheep's head on it. Down the water. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You good? You get it? No, not yet. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, dang, nice. Uh -huh. Man, another five pounder. <laughs> All right, hold him still. Hold him still. After pointing out more fishing spots, Art had to head back to Flamingo, and we went back to the houseboat anchored in Shark River for a break. A break for cameraman Pat Lynch meant wetting a line, and in a live demonstration of how the river got its name, Pat reeled in a four-foot nurse shark, which was released unharmed. Sharks are present throughout the region, which is why swimming is not encouraged here. The shark proved to be our last fish of the day. Next morning, we were up at dawn, ready to try our luck for a couple of hours before heading back to Flamingo. The guys in the skiff caught another trout, and we landed a couple of Spanish mackerel from the houseboat, then hauled anchor. For the return trip, we chose the direct route on the wilderness waterway across Whitewater Bay, passing another rental houseboat along the way. In about four hours, we were back at Flamingo and headed up the road and out of the park, ready to explore the western portion of Everglades National Park. Just a few miles east of the park is Biscayne National Park, a water wonderland, reached by driving east from Homestead on North Canal Drive. Of the park's more than 181,000 acres, 95% is underwater, the remainder in the form of 44 small islands or keys. This is a park to be explored by boat. These hard corals only grow at a rate of a half an inch a year. So it takes about 25 years to get a foot, and you can see there's more than a foot of coral on most of these heads. So they're, most of them are at least 50 to 100 years old to 1,000 here below us right now. There are daily glass bottom boat tours over the coral reefs. The boats depart from the Convoy Point Visitor Center. 
There are also snorkeling and scuba diving trips available. For those bringing their own boats, there are no ramps in the park, but ramps are available at nearby marinas, and the fishing in the park is usually pretty good. But we're heading west, crossing US 41, the Tamiami Trail. About 40 miles west of Miami is the Shark Valley, another fascinating part of Everglades National Park. Here at the headwaters of the Shark River, visitors get to see wildlife native to the region from alligators to wading birds, turtles to snakes. There are trams that cover the loop road, an observation tower, and ranger-led activities. And the alligator, when it's small, over half of its diet comes from this. What do you think apple snails eat? Mosquitoes. The algae, right here. That's right. So the clean water helps these animals to feed. A few miles further west, you'll enter the Big Cypress National Preserve. The Oasis Visitor Center is right on the highway. It's a great place to get information about the preserve, maybe even buy a book or videotape about the region. The 2,400 miles of the preserve constitute a classic swamp. While not a part of the Everglades National Park, the preserve is important to the park ecosystem through the protection of the waters. The Big Cypress, with its towering cypress trees, is home to a variety of bird and animal life, including the endangered Florida panther. Many of the 70 or so remaining cats have been captured and fitted with radio collars as part of a massive research effort aimed at increasing the population. A few more miles west, we turn off the Tamiami Trail and drive three miles south to Everglades City, the western entrance to Everglades National Park, the Wilderness Waterway, and the 10,000 Islands. The Everglades City Hall used to be the Collier County Courthouse until the county seat was moved to Naples several years ago. Being off the beaten track, Everglades City does not attract hordes of tourists. Most people who come here are headed into the park or are here for the great fishing. Several knowledgeable fishing guides operate from marinas along the Barren River, which runs through the town. Driving into town on Route 29, you run right into the Captain's Table Resort. With choices ranging from rooms to efficiencies to two-bedroom suites, it's the best place to stay in the area. And if you bring your own boat, Captain's Table has a launch ramp and docks just steps away from your room. There are also several restaurants right in town. The Last Frontier, which also provides box lunches for anglers, Susie's Station on the Circle, the Rod and Gun Club, and the popular Oyster House just down the road from the Circle. There are several companies which provide airboat rides into the Everglades backcountry. However, they do not operate in Everglades National Park. Sightseeing tours into the park and the 10,000 Islands are available from a concessionaire at the Ranger Station. Rental canoes are also available at the Ranger Station. If you're planning a boat or canoe trip along the Wilderness Waterway or elsewhere in the park, it's a good idea to check in with the park rangers for route and weather information. If you plan to camp, backcountry permits are available here. It's always a good idea to file a float plan with rangers so they'll have some idea of where to find you if you run into trouble while boating or canoeing. Charts are available at the gift shop. In this country, you don't leave the dock without one. Head south from the ranger station across the causeway and you'll come to the end of the road on Chukaluski Island. The first place you'll come to is Outdoor Resorts of America, one of several RV parks in the area. The facility also includes a marina with rental skiffs and fishing guides, a motel, bait and tackle shop, and a launch ramp. This is a popular starting point for canoe trips, and it's where we met up with Mike Siebel of Canoe Country Outfitters in Tampa. He and a friend were about to spend a few days exploring the western end of the Wilderness Waterway. It was winter, a time of reduced mosquito activity. Florida's got some of the best canoeing in the United States. There's a lot of rivers and wetlands and swampy areas that you can take a canoe in. We've got uh, solo canoes this year. This is the first time we've taken little solos. In the past, we've always taken tandems. But uh, even in, we come from the Tampa Bay area, and even this time of year, sometimes it's a little too windy or a little too cool to go out canoeing. So we enjoy coming down here for a week or so during the winter. And it's more like a tropical climate. You can get out and get a suntan in the middle of the winter and just enjoy being away from everything. It's, uh, once you get a couple miles out, it's pretty remote, pretty, pretty much wilderness still. With a 20 mile an hour wind whipping up the bay south of Chukaluski, the first two to three miles of paddling were a real workout even for these veteran canoers. However, when they moved into the more sheltered waters of the Lopez River at the end of the bay, the outing became more pleasure and less work. 
Mike had a chance to talk about canoe safety and preparing for a long trip in the backcountry. I'd recommend that people take a, at a minimum a Red Cross beginning uh, canoe course before they come on a trip like this. But in both Everglades City and Flamingo, you can take short little half day and day long trips that would be fine for beginners. Uh, if you're going to go out and stay overnight and get very far away from very far away from other people, you'd want to have a little bit better skills. You'd be able to want to fend for yourself if you got into a predicament. Just a couple of miles into the river is the Lopez River campsite, named for one of the area's early residents. Mike and Steve would spend the first night here before pushing on through a series of bays to the Houston and Chatham rivers. Mike has paddled the entire 99 miles of the Wilderness Waterway, but this trip would be considerably shorter. We wished them well and headed back to Chukaluski to meet up with a man who probably knows more about the history of these parts than any other living soul, Lauren Totch Brown. Brown and his little dog Troubles are a familiar sight cruising the incredible maze of waterways in the 10,000 islands. And he knows every twist and turn, every oyster bar and mud bank. You see, Totch was born on Chukaluski in 1920. His grandfather, C.G. McKinney, was one of the earliest settlers in 1886 and became a farmer, storekeeper, postmaster, doctor, and newspaper correspondent. Totch eked out a living as a commercial fisherman, guide, and gator hunter. And when times got really tough, he did some poaching and smuggling. He's written about his adventures in the memoir Totch Brown, A Life in the Everglades. Directly across the bay from Chukaluski Island is the mouth of the Turner River. Totch took us into the river, explaining that it was named for Richard Bushrod Turner, a guide whose army unit was ambushed by followers of Seminole leader Billy Bowlegs. Turner later built a home at the mouth of the river. Todge pointed out mounds in the woods along the river that may have been built as places of worship by the Calusas. Todge also told us the Turner is the only one of the many rivers of the area that runs all the way north to Cypress Country and the Tamiami Trail. In fact, many canoers launch from an area right off the highway and paddle south to the Wilderness Waterway. If those canoers we watched struggle across that big bay and talk to Totch, he could have pointed out an easier route. Take a right turn about a mile up the Turner into Hurdles Creek, called the Right Turner by locals, and the canoer finds protected waters all the way to the Lopez River and the Wilderness Waterway. We took that route along the waterway through a series of small bays and then turned into the Chatham River, where we found another popular campsite called the Watson Place. Totch lived here for a couple of years as a child, this was where a man named Ed Watson built a house and ran a farm. Watson was one of the 10,000 Islands' most notorious bad guys. Totch described him as a desperado. He killed a lot of people, threw them in the river with weights. Three bodies come up, floated one day, and he killed two men on uh, Lossman Beach. And the natives just had enough of it and finally killed him at the old trading post at Chukaluski, Smallwood Trading Post. At one point, as we sped through a winding river, a bald eagle took flight and stayed just above us for nearly a mile. Further on, Tatcha's eyes lit up as our approach flushed a flock of white ibis, known locally as curlews. Tatch called them Chukaluski chickens, explaining that before hunting them became illegal, the birds were a staple in the diets of local folks. He said he's never tasted anything better. As the wilderness waterway winds south toward Flamingo, large bays become rivers, and often the rivers narrow to overgrown creeks, barely wide or deep enough for a boat or canoe to negotiate. And in summer, the mosquitoes are a nightmare. In fact, there's a place called the Nightmare. Just past the midway point between Everglades and Flamingo, the waterway runs down the broad river to the gulf then back inside on Broad Creek to the Harney River. There is a shortcut to avoid entering the Gulf, and that's the nightmare. Canoes can make it through the eight miles of the nightmare most of the time. Very small power boats will only get through on a high tide. By the way, if you plan to canoe from Everglades to Flamingo or vice versa, figure on the trip taking a good seven days. Back on Chukaluski Island, Totch told us most of the mangrove islands were too low for man to inhabit. However, about 40 islands were made of shells dredged up by Indians seeking to create their own higher ground, and Chukaluski is the largest of them. Totch told us a lot of stories about the people and places of the 10,000 Islands and his own exploits. 
You'll find them all in another video we call Totch Brown's Tales of the Everglades. Another early pioneer was Ted Smallwood, who settled here in 1896 and opened the store 10 years later. He also took over as postmaster from Totch Brown's grandfather. Today, the store, which was raised on pilings in 1925, is preserved as a museum. For many years, this was the principal trading post for the settlers and Indians of the 10,000 Islands region. While Tonch was showing us around the islands, he mentioned that he used to catch snook with a hand line, that they were so thick he could take home as many as he wanted. Naturally, we asked if he could find us some snook, since they are one of the most desirable inshore game fish in Florida. So with Tonch leading the way, we took two small skiffs up Turner River and into an area the locals call Hell's Half Acre. It looks a lot like the nightmare. After negotiating several creeks, we came into a series of small bays, and almost immediately we started catching snook. Well, at least Dave Clark, the executive producer of this video, caught some. A little one. But they're getting bigger. He is a little bigger, Eddie. Yeah, but he's still... He caught some nice fish, but since the minimum size is a whopping 24 inches, most had to be released. However, Dave landed one beauty, a 27-incher, that fed the crew that night. If you've never eaten snook, trust us, it's one of the best eating fish around. By the way, in order to keep a snook, you need a $2 snook stamp on your fishing license. Incidentally, fish can be caught throughout the park in the 10,000 Islands region. In addition to snook, there are redfish, trout, snapper, tarpon, sheep's head, and several other varieties to be found. And you don't need to seek out the wild creeks that we found. In fact, that kind of adventuring without a guide is not a good idea. You'll most likely get lost. And that's our look at the biggest, most fascinating wilderness area in Florida and some of the wildest country in the United States. Whether you stick to tour boats or strike out on your own in a canoe, houseboat, or fishing skiff, you'll find the Wilderness Waterway and 10,000 Islands of Everglades National Park will provide an unforgettable outdoor experience. If you're like many visitors, one trip won't be enough. You'll return again and again. And as your knowledge of the waters grows, you'll find yourself moving farther and farther afield. So enjoy the experience in Florida's last wild frontier. This program was produced and licensed by International Video Projects Incorporated of Lakeland, Florida. For additional information about this program and other programs we offer, please write International Video Projects, 6700 South Florida Avenue, Suite 28, Lakeland, Florida, 33813-3312, or call toll-free 800-852-0662. Our collection of programs may also be reviewed on our website, www.videoprojects.tv. Thanks for watching.